Uh, light can behave either as a wave or as a particle. Now, last time we talked about the way we use light in engineering, how we use the wave particles of light for various purposes. Uh, the wave properties of light let us understand refraction, refraction of an interface, some absorption and scattering, diffraction, and uh, lets us understand such engineering devices as uh, oh, solar heaters, things of that sort. Uh, particles, when light is viewed as a particle, we get a whole new set of devices, and these are a lot of the modern devices that we now use. Light is waves, we use see for the transmission of information. Uh, light is particles, we um, can understand transmission and absorption, the behavior of things like photodetectors and photoconductors, and finally light emitting diodes and lasers. The, um, and I'll, I'll discuss those in turn. Uh, if you regard light as a particle, then it is a phonon, a particle that has a certain energy, H nu, and that is the energy that it can give up. It's quantized, it can only give up that energy. So if we start throwing light into a material, it can only be absorbed by the material, it can only interact with the material. If there is a transition in the material that can use precisely the energy, H nu, of the incoming photon. Well, there are um, three such things that can happen. Uh, we, at, at low energies, in a semiconductor or insulator, we can have extrinsic excitations, exciting an electron to an acceptor level, or exciting an electron from a donor level into the conduction band, so we might expect absorptions associated with that. Uh, there can be ionic excitations within the band gap, and there can also be intrinsic excitations in which we excite electrons all the way across the band gap. In fact, if you look at the absorption spectrum in, in, in a typical semiconductor or insulator, as you increase the energy, first of all, we have various discrete absorptions, those within the band, these ionic excitations. Then we have a step at the edge of the main absorption band, which is equal to extrinsic excitations to donors or acceptors. And finally, the very big absorption, which happens when our intensity is sufficient to excite electrons across the band. Uh, this incidentally gives rise to the classic notion that if you can see through a material, it is almost certainly an insulator. In fact, in terms of electronic transitions, it's always an insulator because something that you can see through must have a band gap beyond the energy of the visible range. And that's going to give you a band gap of two electron volts or more, which means that uh, it's going to behave as an insulator. The excitations, within the, um, uh, the excitations within the band gap are the things that are usually responsible for the color of insulators. We put these in intentionally in, in an awful lot of colored glasses and other such things to, to give us the color of the insulated material. And we, of course, choose impurities that have particular ionic excitations to give the color of the material. One of the funnier stories in that regard, if you were ever to go to Boston and take a tour of the city, you might be led to the first, well, the first 400 addresses in Beacon Street in Boston, starting from Piccadilly going out. That's where the term the 400 came from, which was a term they used for the 1% the, the, the back in the 19th century, the rich people in America. And if you go to the beginning of that series, you'll see lots of very old houses that have little tiny window panes. They go back to the time of the Revolutionary War, and nobody could make transparent glass larger than a tiny window pane. So instead of having big picture windows, you have big picture windows divided into a whole bunch of tiny little panes, and the panes are empty. If you look at some of the upper stories in some of those houses, you will see that some of the panes are pink. These pink panes are enormously valuable. And they're put only in upper windows so that no one can walk in on the street and steal them or break them or anything of that sort. And they go back to kind of an interesting thing that has to do with the color of glass and with color centers. The thing that will turn glass into pink, kind of magenta pink, is manganese. And way back in the 1700s, there was a manufacturer of window glass in England. And he was mixing up window glass and selling it to people. And one of his, um, his, his workers one day made a terrible mistake. They accidentally introduced a manganese impurity into a supply of window glass. So out came all these pink window panes. So the directors got together in something of a panic and said, what the hell are we going to do with all these pink window panes? Well, some of them came up with a clever idea. Let's send them to Boston and tell all those dumb Yankees that this is the latest craze in England. So they did. So the whole ship of pink window panes to Boston. And everybody lapped them up immediately as the latest craze. And it's good given communication in those days, it was decades before they realized that they had been had. But in a real sense, they hadn't been had. Because those pink window panes have suddenly become enormously valuable. And if you go to Beacon Street, you'll find some of them isolated in those windows today, the pride and joy of whoever owns that particular house. So color of glass is done by adding the right impurities. Sometimes it's done intentionally for good, sometimes it's done unintentionally, and you can still make money on it if you're smart enough. Photoconductivity. The, um, uh, one of the things that you can, of course, do with light is you can create, use light to create conductors where uh, there would otherwise be none. Light at suitable wavelength can excite carriers. Uh, so a semiconductor insulator begins to behave like a metal. Uh, where we use that are places like, oh, for example, the uh, electric eye and the, the garage door opener. You, know, you have a beam of light. When that beam of light is broken, the door opens. Well, what that beam of light is doing is hitting some kind of semiconductor, and the um, frequency of the light is such that it will excite uh, carriers from the conduction band to the valence band. And these carriers then become a population of carriers which can be used to conduct electricity. Uh, this is photoconductivity. If the light is turned off, we have no conductivity. If the light is turned on, we have a conductor. So it behaves as a switch. The, um, in, in, in understanding the behavior of these photoconductors, it is, however, important to notice that from the point of view of their optical properties, uh, semiconductors can be divided into two classes. And the two classes depend on, if we look at the band structure of the material, the electron energy will depend on the wave number, or wave uh, number K, of the electron that's being transmitted in the material. And in fact, the band that we see gives us all of the energies over a range of, of wave numbers that the material can have. So look at energy as a function of K, the valence band may look as I've described here, the conduction band may look as I've described at the top here, and the gap is the minimum energy difference between them. There are then two possibilities. One possibility is what we call a direct gap material in which the bottom of the conduction band is directly above the top of the valence band, almost always at vector k equals zero by symmetry. When this is the case, then we can shine a photon, which has this, this frequency, and we excite electrons directly from the valence band to the conduction band. Other materials, for example silicon, unfortunately, are what we call indirect gap materials. In this case, the bottom of the conduction band is displaced as a different wave number than the top of the valence band. In fact, by symmetry, if the top of the valence band is at k equals zero, they will be symmetrically disposed minimally in the conduction band, and um, they will, will be at some other k. When this is the case, remember that momentum must be conserved everywhere in physics. And the momentum of an electron is h bar k, where k is its wave number. So if momentum is conserved, I can't just knock an electron from the top of the valence band to the bottom of the conduction band in an indirect gap material. I have to do something with the momentum. A phonon has to participate. Usually it's a lattice vibration of phonons that has to participate. There are other possible processes. But in this case, the transition from the bottom, top of the valence band to the bottom of the conduction band is always a really messy one. So we do not get clean optical properties out of these indirect gap materials. Uh, gallium arsenide is a direct gap material. Silicon is an indirect gap material. 
So if you look at the optical devices that you have available to you, you will find many, many of them using gallium arsenide as the optically active ingredient. You'll find very few that use silicon. And the reason is the messiness of the uh, uh, photon-induced transitions in indirect gap materials such as silicon. Gallium arsenide with a couple of others as well as direct gap materials, and those are the materials that are the materials of choice in, in optical devices. In the photoconductor, usually what happens is we'll have a structure something like this. There'll be a, a junction here at which the, uh, uh, the energy uh, drops. Uh, you will illuminate uh, one part of that photoconductor creating electrons, which are swept into the, uh, towards the positive terminal into the second region and combined with holes and uh, uh, produce your current. And this is a typical uh, photoconductor for an electric eye or a photodetector. Uh, we can also make transistors that are photoelectronic. Remember, a transistor is uh, basically just a switch. It is on when we do something. It's off when we don't do that. And in an uh, electronic transistor, let's have a, uh, an emitter base and collector as a normal bipolar transistor. But now, instead of placing a voltage on the base, let's illuminate the base. If we illuminate the base with the right um, uh, uh, illumination, we'll have exactly the same effect as if we were to turn on the voltage. We excite carriers here in the base, saturate all the holes in the base, and those carriers can get swept into the collector. And so the, uh, when the light is on, the switch is on. When the light is off, the switch is off. The nice thing about these um, um, photoelectric transistors is that they use virtually no current. We don't have to worry about controlling voltages very much, except in the primary line itself. And they can be enormously fast because light turns on and off at the speed of light. So there has been a, a very serious development of these photoelectronic transistors for many years, and they are used in a number of devices now. The thing that has held them back is that they, it's been proven rather difficult to miniaturize these photoelectronic devices that you can miniaturize through, through uh, things like field effect transistors and so on that use uh, electric fields. So uh, getting a, um, a fully miniaturized photoelectronic transistor, photoelectronic circuit has been proven to be a challenging problem. But there are folks working on that problem all the time. You'll, you just open up the right journal, and you will find entire conferences on these sorts of things. Dale Daniel is showing progress in that field. Photocopiers. I was asked, uh, <laughs> this unfortunately goes a, a full generation past you people, but when we got the turn of the millennium, they sent a bunch of people out and be one of them asking us a vote on what was the most significant technological breakthrough of the last half century at that time. And the one I put in was the Xerox machine. Those of you who have never lived without a photocopier cannot imagine the revolution that happened when the photocopier came in. When I entered college, there was no such thing as a photocopier. Well, it was in the laboratory, but not out there. You, in order to make a copy of a document, you went to what was called a thermofax machine. They produced a, you may have actually seen one of them in some archaic demonstration. They would produce copies of blue on yellow paper. You paid about 25 cents a page. You could buy a pack of cigarettes for 25 cents at that time. You could buy a can of beer for 25 cents, <laughs> which gave you an indication of how many cents it was costing you. And uh, it, it took about five minutes per page to make. It was an incredibly cumbersome system. The uh, Xerox machine hit where I was in about 1962, and instantly everybody was copying everything. It was still very expensive in those days, 10 cents a page, but the convenience, the speed, and everything just, just revolutionized how things were done. Uh, now, of course, we've gone beyond that to scanners and digital and so on, so you don't really use photocopies much anymore. At least I don't. I put everything on screen. But it was an incredible revolution in terms of the ability to store and, and, and communicate information at the time it came in. A uh, photocopier is, is still a, a standard printer working pretty much the same way. It uses uh, photoconductors, and it works essentially in the following way. Suppose that we have a plate that's at least a weak insulator, and we charge it. My, uh, my beam is slowly dying here. The top figure shows you a, a, a photoconductive plate that's charged positive on one side and negative on the other side. Now suppose we would like to print a pattern using that photoconducting as a way to do it. All we have to do here, I've shown a mask, but it can also be a, a piece of paper that you shine a bright light on so that it reflects onto this display. And where the light is reflected or transmitted or whatever, it hits the surface of the photoconductor and you get a local discharge. But the charge is removed from those locations where the light strikes it, either by reflection from the printed page or by transmission to a mask or however you want to do it. You can then take those places, you can then take that plate, which now has charge where they're um, where the original mask was black and no charge where the mask was white. Now suppose I just uh, pass that through some kind of toner. And in the toner, suppose I have little uh, uh, elements of print, little ink elements, powders if you want, which are carrying negative charge. They will be attracted and will deposit on this plate precisely where the uh, positive charges are there and in that pattern. I can then take a new piece of paper, put it down on this plate, uh, and impose a voltage which zeroes out all these charges, at which point the toner is transferred to the paper, and I get a print of the original thing that I was seeing. And that's basically the way the Xerox machine works, a photocopier. It's a use of photoconductivity to copy information. Uh, and we, that's basically what we use today in, uh, in, 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 in uh, uh, digital printers. You, of course, can do this with color by just printing three times in the three primary colors and so on. So this is basically how that works. Again, using photoconductive uh, photo, photo materials. Photo emitters. Um, we also want to use the photonic properties of material to create light. A classic example is a TV screen. You look at the TV screen, you see light coming out of the TV screen that shows you the picture. There are many other cases, but uh, the TV screen is a classic use of what we call a phosphor. Um, a phosphor is an ionic emitter. What a phosphor is, it's an insulating material that contains ions within it that are very carefully chosen, particularly if you want a color uh, a screen. Uh, and what will happen in that is that we have an excitation level of the phosphor which is excited by a particular frequency of the incoming light. If I want to, um, for example, produce a blue image, I would have a phosphor which is excited by um, a particular frequency that would ultimately give me blue light. But that happens actually in, in a couple of steps. What happens in the phosphor is that I use the incoming light to excite the phosphor to a higher energy level. So if I'm talking about an individual ion, as soon as I excite, for example, the electron charge, I change the electron distribution, there's going to be a change in the lattice surrounding that ion. Because the ion effectively is going to get bigger for no other reason. The charge distribution is going to change. So there will probably be a relaxation. The relaxation will cause the energy levels to shift slightly so that the light emitted by the phosphor will be a different frequency from the light absorbed by the phosphor, maybe even a different material. I may be using electrons to excite this, this energy and, and produce photons. But I choose my phosphor so that the emitted photon over here is the frequency that I want it to be, the color that I want it to be. And then, of course, in, in monitoring and color images, uh, you um, oh, incidentally, the, the advantage in this is that since we have this relaxation, the frequency of the emitted radiation is different from the frequency of the excited radiation. And that means that this emitted radiation is not going to be absorbed. If we had a situation in which there was no relaxation and the emitted radiation was the same frequency as the excited radiation, we would never get out of the phosphor because it would all be properly absorbed by exciting other, other excited states. This relaxation is what lets us get light out of the phosphor, 
we choose our phosphors so that these two levels are controlled, so that we have a convenient excitation frequency, and then the emitted light is the light that we want. And of course, in a color screen, you uh, a color TV monitor, you're producing three different phosphors to give you the three different primary colors. In fact, these days, some people use more than, th than the three colors for, to enrich the picture, and uh, that's basically how those work. Um, photo light emitting diodes. Uh, light emitting LEDs are, of course, becoming um, very popular these days. More and more of our in-house lighting is going toward LEDs. I may end up investing in some myself because they last for a hugely long time. They use very little current, very little electricity. Unfortunately, they're kind of expensive, but uh, are very, very useful, uh, very useful thing. Uh, for an LED, we are going to use a semiconductor to emit light. And we do that in the following way. We first of all, uh, the LED is basically just a PN junction. We use a direct back semiconductor in forward bias. So here we have a, a region, which is a P-type. Um, here we have a region that is N-type. We, uh, uh, we uh, excite electrons, force them into this region in which light is emitted, and then through the combination of electrons and holes, emit light at the frequency that we want. So basically, we're converting current by putting this, uh, this uh, 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 junction in forward bias. We're converting current, which is the flow of these electrons, into light because in a direct gap conductor, the, uh, the emission from the recombination of electrons and holes is going to be in the form of photons. And those photons will, if this is a well-defined gap, if this is a direct gap conductor, so I have a well-defined band gap, then what's going to come out here will be light of a given frequency, a light of a given color, and that's our LEDs. Uh, there was a huge search for many of these. We had very good LEDs coming out in everything but the color blue. And for over a decade, there was an international search for blue LEDs. And that problem was finally solved with uh, gallium, gallium nitride. Kind of blank on the one. Anyway, that problem was recently solved, and now we have the full color spectrum with these LEDs. Gallium nitride is uh, Lasers. Laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Uh, it was, these were first invented back in the late 1940s. Charlie Fowns, who still hangs out over here, even he's naive, but still quite lucid, I can assure you, uh, was the fellow who came up with it. I think I mentioned it at the first lecture of the course that I happened to have dinner with him back in the early 1960s, and we first, uh, he goes to my fraternity house, and we, we asked him, well, you've got these lasers, well, what are you going to use them for? Because about the only thing anybody had in mind was Buck Rogers and his ray gun shooting the enemy. Uh, and he frankly didn't know. <laughs> it was kind of interesting. It was many years before lasers really got into uh, practical applications. Some of the first practical applications were cutting tools. Uh, this is very ancient. The first James Bond movie had poor James about to cut in half by laser. And there, in fact, were, were lasers used for cutting in very early stages. The principal application of lasers these days is in communication, transmission of information. And that was a long time coming. Not until fairly recently did we, ever, did we really use lasers for that purpose. Um, as far as the ray guns, that they tried and they tried and they tried. I was on a committee down at Livermore that was working that very problem for a number of years. There were just huge barriers to it, largely because you shoot out a laser beam. It may be perfectly collimated, but it has to travel through the air. And there's just so much radio scattering in the air, getting that thing to focus is really tough with enough intensity to do damage at a distance. They've solved that problem. We now have naval vessels with laser guns mounted on them, and they're shooting things out of the water, and I don't know how they do that. <laughs> they solved some problems we could not figure out how to solve. And I don't have a clearance anymore, so they don't tell me how they solved it. But I, I'm really curious. One of these days I'll find out. All right, how does the laser work? Uh, it's stimulated radiation. Now, what you want to do with a laser? You would like to get light that is not only a very precisely defined frequency, but such that the light is at the same phase, so that the beam doesn't scatter, they don't interfere, they reinforce one another. The trick that you can use to do that is the following. And Charlie Towns first did it in actually some sort of laser rather than a laser with, with, with individual atoms, kind of phosphorus in a way. Uh, suppose that you have an excitation. Let's let this be a, 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 an ion, a ruby, uh, maybe even uh, chromium and ruby. And uh, suppose that you excite that, um, you, you use an incoming radiation to excite the transition. Now let's suppose that you uh, choose that transition. It relaxes, just like I showed you before in the case of the phosphor. But now let's suppose that I have been clever enough to use quantum mechanics. Now quantum mechanics will tell you, if you look at the possible transitions in, in an atom, that some of those transitions are very easy, some of those transitions are more difficult, and some of those transitions are forbidden. So if you choose a phosphor that has a transition to a forbidden level, you can accumulate atoms in excited states up here because they can't trans transfer back. So there's no such thing as a totally forbidden transition. They'll, they'll transfer back. It's going to be very slow. However, there's a trick you can then play. So my first clever bit of physics is to find a phosphor that gives me a transition to a forbidden level where I can't, trans tra I can't transfer back to the ground state naturally. I can then use a second quantum mechanical feature, which is called stimulated radiation. It turns out that if I have a forbidden transition that has a certain frequency that happens, and if I attack this excited state with precisely that frequency of radiation, then I can stimulate this transition that otherwise wouldn't happen. And the photon that I get out will not only have the same frequency as a stimulating photon, it will have the same phase too. So I can do the following. Let me make a material like this. Let me use my exciting radiation to produce a very high population of these, um, of, of, of these forbidden, these forbidden uh, electrons in these forbidden levels, where the, where the transition is forbidden, the, level, the transition is forbidden. Now, some of these are going to spontaneously transform. When it spontaneously transforms, I can cheat, but in the natural case, some of these will spontaneously transform.